Thanks so much for the invitation. For one, uh, I think we've got some interesting data to share with you today. And kudos to whoever thought the title of this conference, uh, Reclaiming Resilience. I think that's, uh, you know, just, you know, something that's uh, tremendously current. It's something that's very timely. It's something that's very important, I think. Okay, how many, how many of you uh, got empathy for this poor guy? You know, I've been farming for 40 some years and uh, uh, I tell you that uh, we definitely had our ups and downs and uh, I think most of you that are in the business understand uh, the challenges and ups and downs that you got in agriculture. Many times we don't know where that journey is going to take us. And over the several years that we've been involved, it's been a wild journey. A lot of crossroads, a lot of, a lot of choices we had to make. And we didn't know for sure if we got to the end of that journey what the rewards might be. We hoped that we're, there was going to be reward, rewards for our efforts. And uh, uh, in this presentation, that is one of the things that we hope to share with you today, the, the rewards that we found. My wife and I, as Sarah said, farm up in northern Iowa, Mitchell County. Started farming conventionally in the early 70s. We're just south of the North Pole. Most people say you can't do cover crops and no-till in that part of the state. And my friends in Minnesota for sure say you can't do cover crops and farming in that part of the world. But we spent a great uh, deal of our lifetime trying to prove them wrong. First fork in the road for me. That happened in, that happened in the winter of 91-92. We didn't get our plowing done. At that time, as I said, we were conventional farmers. We, we plowed our corn stalks and we used a conventional drill to plant soybeans and, uh, you know, we didn't have any way of working with any amount of residue for sure. And uh, it was that winter I was reading an article in Farm Journal magazine about a young farmer in southwest Minnesota who was no-tilling soybeans with a John Deere 750 drill. Raise your hand if you're familiar with what a 750 drill is. Most people in here, they've, they're familiar with those. They kind of revolutionized, you might say, no-till soybeans in at least this part of the country in the 90s. And so today, we, you know, we still continue to drill soybeans. We, uh, we moved to a planter since then, and, uh, you know, this is our goal, you know, is to get a beautiful stand of soybeans in a, in a good stand of residue, and uh, uh, we've had success in that in many ways. Our second fork in the road came about 10 years later, and that was strip-till corn. You know, once you start no-tilling soybeans, you start to go to a few no-till meetings, and uh, the conversation always goes like this. Well, you're no-tilling soybeans, what are you doing for corn? Oh my God, we were still working our ground ahead of corn. We, we weren't doing any no-till corn. And if I sit there and I looked at the yield results for Kanawha and I looked at the yield results for Nashua, them were the two university stations closest to me, man, you'd see a 10, 15 bushel lag for no-till corn. So why would you be excited about it? But, you know, the conversation always led on to you weren't going to really see a change in your soil health come and, until you, you know, got away from that full-width tillage. And so it was about this time when we started to hear about strip till. It was a new practice that was coming out of Illinois and, and starting to evolve across the Midwest. And my local fertilizer dealer and I, we took a trip to southern Minnesota again. Seems like we always go to Minnesota to find our answers in northern Iowa. And talked to a gentleman named Ray, Ray Ronhorst. Ray was, was doing strip till up there right in the heart of the Des Moines lobe in southern Minnesota. And I was making it work very successfully. And so it was that fall that my fertilizer dealer bought his first strip-till bar, and he started doing custom strip-till for me, and he still continues to do my strip-till today. You know, basically, uh, in our part of the world, we, we put our fall P and K down in those strips, and then come spring, when we go out to plant in them, we find those strips to be, you know, drier. We find them to be warmer seven to 10 degrees warmer than what the middles are. They're gonna be as drier, drier than the neighbor's conventional ground is. And so the system worked real well, especially timeliness. We, you know, we got a shorter season up there in, in Northern Iowa and it's all about getting corn in the ground. 
in a timely basis. And so the strip till has worked very well for us. And this is our ultimate goal, is to get a beautiful stand of uh, soybeans established in uh, those strips. The, the, uh, pardon me, stand of corn. And the corn is more uniform, grows real well. You know, as in 2005, you know, I still was always questioning whether this system worked well for us. And we'd done a replicated trial in our farm that year, and we, we didn't see a single, it was like three-tenths of a bushel difference at 195 bushel level. So I, I never looked back. Strip till became a practice of norm for us. Third fork in the road wasn't near as decisive. In other words, it took a lot longer to develop for us. And that was cover crops. You know, I first, you know, had an awareness of the need or the possibility of cover crops we got into June 2008, we're starting to see weather change. We're starting to see significantly more rainfall. It's just changing the way you had to do business. This is our farm and you know, we don't own Lakeshore property, although my wife thinks that's something we need to buy. Uh, we had it there for a couple days. This was a day later in Charles City, Iowa on the banks of the Cedar River. And I think most all of us remember the serious floods in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, five days later, we're in that watershed. And I think an awareness just kind of came across, you know, our minds that, you know, some of the practices that we do on our farms can have a major effect on people downstream. Not only the quality of the water, but especially the quantity. Look what that flood cost that city. They, they were beginning to have an interest in in, in things in the watershed above them. Then I got elected to the Iowa Soybean Board in 2009. That was probably one of the more life-changing events for me. And I got heavily involved in the on-farm network. And we started doing cover crop trials in 2012 on our farm. And it's where you put out replicated strips and we were comparing varieties of, of cover crops, seeding dates of cover crops and and yields and so forth and you were just really trying to get our feet wet because there was such an interest in cover crops at that time and the Iowa Soybean Association was just trying to gather some data so we had a better idea of you know what we could tell our membership and then the nutrient reduction strategy came out from Iowa in 2013 basically it was a response to the Gulf hypoxia zone uh, situation in the Gulf you know the environmental groups sued EPA and said you weren't doing your job enforcing the Clean Water Act and EPA reached out to the individual states and said help us we would rather this be a state run program instead of a federal and so states went and designed nutrient reduction strategies and of course Iowa was the first one to come out we look in that strategy and we could see that cereal rye cover crops oats had a tremendous reduction on the amount of nitrates that that left the field in the, in the water we looked at the phosphorus reductions and again tremendous reduction 29 percent you know 33 percent i i i the, the no-till really caught my eye because i'd finally converted to no-till beans and strip till corn and i said boy i'm i'm halfway there and so i got real excited about you know further you know development of you know the nutrient strategy and then we got into, you know, we started hearing more and more news about soil health. It became the dominant news of most of our farm publications. Uh, I haven't read a conventional article in a farm press for, for several years now. It's, it's all about improving soil health and doing practices as such. And you start going to soil health meetings, and this is where I run into Jerry Hatfield, you know, and, and we, we learned a lot together, you know, about what farming practices and cover crops could do to improving soil health. But it was a message I heard from Doug Peterson. Doug Peterson's a Iowa, Missouri soil health specialist at a meeting in Osage about three years ago. And uh, his message was strong enough that I finally made the decision that I, I needed to mute, move beyond just doing trial work to moving into 100% cover crops because Folks, I'm no spring chicken, and if I was going to survive and farm long enough to see the benefits, I needed to get started. So we just completed our third year of 
cover crops ahead of corn and soybeans. This is what we look forward to now, is having, you know, a, a beautiful cover crop to plant soybeans into. This is 35 days later. You can see what a successful establishment you can have, the beautiful amount of residue you have in that field, the weed control, the soil savings, the, the nutrient savings. It's just it's tremendous what you can do with that. This is what we hope to get ahead of corn. We still strip till, but we grow cover crops as well. And, and this is the kind of biomass that uh, we hope to get ahead of our corn. And a month later, this is, this is the end results that we're looking for. So what has my data revealed? Over that period of time, we've seen a lot of things change. And I think one of the biggest changes that we noticed was the change in organic matter on our farms. You know, I said I just started farming in the 70s. I worked with a crop consultant all those years, and we were continually pulling soil samples. We soil sample the soybean stubble every year in June, so you're basically on a two-year sampling period. But back in 1984, the only reason we pulled organic matter samples is because the crop consultant wanted to know what herbicide rates to use. That's the only reason we needed it. And it costs a little more for that, so we don't usually pull organic matter samples every year. So we adopted no-till and strip-till in that decade after 84. And then the next time we pulled organic matter samples was 07, and we saw a significant increase. Now these three farms are color-coded. The light green farm is more of a timber-based farm. The other two farms are prairie soils. And if you can't read the numbers, in 84, there's 2.3 to 3.3. In 2012, we noticed another significant raise. And then in 2015, we're starting to pull organic matter samples now because we really want to know what's happening. In 2015, we continued to see an increase in organic matter. But all in all, it was about a 2.5% increase over 25 years. That's a long time. But that's about one-tenth of one percent per year. And if you talk to any of the soil specialists at the universities in the upper Midwest, they'll tell you that is entirely doable in the corn bean rotation when you discontinue your full width tillage. And that's basically what we've done there. But I was concerned about what's my potential. You know, this is starting to flatten it out. It's not quite as steep. Or what historically might that have been? So in 2005, we pulled samples out of the fence rows. And we found them to run from 6 to 9%. 6% was related to the, the timber base, the 9% on those prairie-based soils. Folks, the sad part is, is that we decreased our soil organic matter by 2 thirds somewhere in our farming history when we got into a more intensive tillage program or so forth. Two-thirds. It's taken me 25 years to get half of that back. Now, it doesn't matter if it doesn't have any value. That's the key. What, what kind of value does soil organic matter have? So I reached out and, and tried to find somebody that had taken the time to document a value for soil organic matter. And I found this brochure, and it was put out by the Iowa Division of NRCS. And many of the authors are, are university people and people I know well, so there's a lot of credibility behind this. And in that brochure, they give me an incremental value for 1% soil organic matter. And I put in parentheses there 10 tons. Those of us that... Uh, have raised livestock and we've hauled bedded manure out on a field. We kind of know what 10 ton of material is. That's a lot of stuff. And in a six inch core, that's what 1% soil organic matter is. It's about 10 tons of material. But in that, they give me a value of $18 for enhanced water availability. In the parentheses here, you notice the 2080 rule. This I'll tribute to Jerry Hatfield and his team at USDA Agricultural Research Service in Ames. 
I've heard Jerry speak on this many times, but Jerry has said over and over again that we lose 20% of our potential yield 80% of the time because of the lack of plant available moisture. I'll repeat that. We lose 20% of our yield 80% of the time because of lack of plant available moisture. Now we're not talking about rainfall here. This is about the moisture that does come from rain, but it also has to enter the soil. It has to be absorbed by the soil, held by the soil and the particles and the organic matter. If your soil quality is so poor that when you get a rain it runs off, that doesn't count for anything. And that's what soil organic matter does. Is it, it builds an ability of that soil to retain and hold water. It also gives us a mineralizable value of N and P of about $11 an acre. And just recently, well, I think it was last week, I was reading an article put out by Ohio State and Kansas State when they put in the value of sulfur, raised that value to 12 bucks an acre. So it's significant and it's verified by several universities. But that gives us a total value of per 1% organic matter of $29 an acre. Well, the old farmer math starts churning in my head, and I says, I got 2.5% more now than I used to have. What's that worth? That's, that simply is worth $72 an acre per year. That's significant. Now, it took 25 years to get that. That didn't happen overnight. But capitalize that. You know, take a 5% cap rate, and you're talking over $1,400 an acre that my farm ought to be worth than my neighbor right across the fence who's still doing conventional tillage and he hasn't built any soil health yet. How many of you as farmers when you go rent a piece of ground ask what the organic matter is? How many people would you sell a farm tell the realtor what the soil organic matter is? I guess until we start asking for it, it probably doesn't have a value to us, but it potentially should because it really does add a lot to our productivity. So what else have we learned from a study of 17 years worth of yield data from 10 different fields? Just a little bit of history of this before I turn it over to Jerry. I was asked to give a presentation to NRCS back in July, so in April I reached out to Jerry just to have a discussion about potentially what I should be talking about and what material I might want to add to a presentation, but long story short, it come around to where Jerry asked me if I'd be willing to share any of my digital yield data. He didn't even know for sure if I had any digital yield data when he asked the question. And a lot of farmers would probably be a little reluctant to share any of their farm data with the USDA. But I took it another way. I thought, what an opportunity to get another set of eyes to look at a set of data that more or less just sat on my computer and that I casually looked at seasonally. And so I loaded it up on a flash drive and, and sent that stuff down to Jerry Hatfield. And I'm going to turn this over to Jerry at this time because Jerry's going to share with you what, what he found. All right, thanks, Wayne. And, uh, Sarah, thanks for the uh, invitation and everything, and thanks for the accommodation so that I can do this from uh, from Florida. You know, it's a little nicer here than it is in Iowa right now. Sarah told me not to rub that in, but uh, you know, if we start and and look at this, and and as Wayne pointed out, that you know they've seen a lot of changes in their farm over this, and and it's rare that we have an opportunity to take actual field data across multiple fields and begin to examine exactly what happens when we change uh, farming practices. And part of this is because in research, uh, we, we don't tend to have long-term studies and, and things like this. So we would want to share with you what we've learned uh, in all of this process as we go through. I think you'll find it interesting. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, you know, and, and so we had yield monitor data from Wayne from 2003 to 2018, uh, you know, and that took us a while to process uh, all of that across all those fields. 
we took each of those fields and we put the soils maps into them so we could actually look at yield monitor data by the soil type within each field. Uh, Wayne keeps very meticulous records on uh, the weather each year. So we had all the rainfall data. And then you've seen his uh, soil organic matter data across fields and across years as well. So that was our data availability. Let's just go to the next one. Uh, and I want to point out that here's, here's the change that's occurred in, in Mitchell County and Wayne's data for April, September rainfall. And you see this from the early 2000s, uh, 2003 to that 2018. Wayne has to cope with seven more inches of annual rainfall in that growing season compared to what it was when back in the, the 70s. And we see that across that. And then we look at climate. Not only do we see that there's an increase in annual precipitation, most of this occurring during the summer, but we're seeing an increase in spring rainfall as well. And so, you know, we're seeing all of this and the summer rainfall is becoming more variable. And, you know, when we start bringing these pieces together, we need to understand the dynamics of, of what's going on with our system out here. So let's just go to the next one. Uh, you know, we started looking at this and then we did all sorts of different analyses on this. It's, it's a very rich data set when you start looking at this. So we looked at the means and standard deviations of yield by, by field and by year. We looked at skewness and kurtosis and I'll explain what that means of the yield data segregated by the soils within each field. Uh, we did geospatial analysis to quantify field variability. Uh, you know, it's always assumed as we do these practices that we reduce tillage, add cover crops, that fields are gonna become more uniform, but rarely do we have the data sets to evaluate that. And we also looked at water use efficiency. Was the capability of, of production in that Mitchell County area on Wayne's farm getting more efficient in using the rainfall that was occurring during the summer to be able to uh, grow that crop. And so those are the types of data analyses that we've been looking at. Let's just go to the next one. And so what we did in the first time just on corn, uh, these are all the different fields. Uh, we looked at his average yield against that line, which is the Mitchell County uh, yield. And you can see that and in all truth that's out there is that sometimes we win, uh, sometimes we lose uh, in terms of this uh, in, in relative to the county average. And, you know, I've made a, a long-term study of looking at county average yields uh, in terms of time. And, and a lot of this is uh, hybrid selection. Uh, you know, there are, there are hybrids that respond to these conditions. There are some that don't uh, and all these different things you can see in 2012, some fields are way above the, the county average, some that were below the county average. And so we see this, but we're seeing more and more of those trend lines uh, in the latter part of the years in which there's very few of those points that are below the county average. Um, and we go to the next one. Uh, we see that same thing in terms of uh, looking at those county average versus this is that some of this is due to, to management practices. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at this and genetics by environment, by management interaction, and that, uh, you know, and a lot of this is better nitrogen management. You see that uh, he was behind the county average until he uh, began to use side dress application to do a better job of nitrogen management, and then has basically been at or above the county average uh, all the way along and uh, for the strip cell system. So. We see that piece of the puzzle in there. So I'd, we can never discount the fact that what we do with management has a tremendous impact on, on production yields uh, that we begin to look at. And so let's just go to the next one. Here's soybeans. Uh, you can see that the uh, soybean yields uh, didn't quite show that precipitous drop in 2012 that, uh, that corn did. Uh, actually, 2013, the county average yields were lower in 2013 than they were in, in 2012. 
rapid rise in there. We've seen a decrease a little bit in 2017 and a rebound in 2018. Uh, but you see that, you know, his fields have been performing uh, remarkably well relative to the county average. And again, it's, uh, it's cultivar selection and, and some of these different dynamics that are going on. So, you know, we want to make sure that people understand that, you know, that as we look at yields from production fields and the farmers have out there that uh, we need to understand what they're doing relative to the county uh, as well, just on the aggregate to see uh, how we're progressing. So let's go to the next one. Uh, you know, you look at this, uh, you know, as we, be, as Wayne began to change, part of that was moving to 15 inch rows uh, in 2008 onward, where we saw a bigger increase uh, relative to the county average. So again, here's a management practice that is an adoption of, of things that have allowed these uh, responses to begin to occur that have a, have a positive impact on, on production and particularly for an individual producer. So, you know, I think that, that be, we need to understand that all production decisions have an impact, uh, some of them positive, but, you know, some of them uh, may not produce the results that we want just for a variety of reasons that are out there. So let's Jerry, go to the next one. To say, uh, Jerry, I might cut in here just a second. You know, it, right here uh, in, in 2016, that was the first year we planted green in the soybeans, and that was the best yield I ever raised. So, it, you know, it that was one thing that was confirming. But I think on, on these county yields, both corn and soybeans, I think the message that I want to get across is, number one, we're on a lean fertility program. We're not on a Ray Doughty program where we're, we're trying to win record yields everywhere. But we've adopted a ton of conservation in northern Iowa where it's not supposed to work, and yet our yields are tracking along just fine. And I think that's the biggest fear that most farmers have is that when they adopt the extreme conservation measures that we've adopted, that their yields are gonna fall apart and they can't be competitive. And, and so I wanted to throw that in before we, we move to the next one. Pardon me, Jerry. Oh, and that's fine. I think Wayne, that's, that's great because as we begin to look at this, uh, you know, I think that that's always been a, uh, a standard statement across here is when we adopt conservation practices that they're gonna cost us productivity. And you look at these historical yield patterns of, uh, in, as Wayne said, in a, in a county in which it's not supposed to work because it's too far north, it's too cold, it's too wet, you got all these different things. And yet, uh, you know, it's showing the, a positive impact on this. Just giving a couple examples of, of this, uh, and, and I'll go into this in more detail. This is the data, the black lines, uh, the dark lines on the left are from 2004. You see that as we move to 2018 on that, that field, that uh, we increased the yields, but then we also begin to tighten the distribution about that uh, yield uh, as over time. And so let's go to the next one. Uh, this is uh, Frederick soybeans. You can see again, the same thing is that as we went from 2004 to 2018 in this field, again, we increased the, the productivity of that field, but it also decreased the variation around the mean. And, and we, so this quite intrigued us with what was going on with this overall yield set in terms of the, the dynamics of this. Uh, if we go to the next one, you know, what we began to see is now we took and segregated out uh, each of these fields by the soil type within the field. And so you see this 2004 to 2018, and we did frequency analysis as, along with the yield distribution. A couple things that begin to occur uh, as we begin to look at this is that the skewness began to become more positive. And then I'll go to a little bit more elaborate detail on that. And so we, we shifted uh, yields from the low end into more of the mean uh, part of the field. The kurtosis increased because we were getting tighter around that distribution. And this was on the Osterlander uh, loam soil within that. Let's go to the next one. Uh, just give you a couple examples. This is the uh, Franklin silt loam. Uh, 2005 versus 2017, 
in that same field. And, you know, the, the weather in, in both of those years was, was pretty similar. Uh, in this, uh, the yields, uh, you can see that shift uh, was about 180 in uh, 2005 and about 232, I think, in, uh, in 2017. So we, 50 bushels more in that, that period of time, but that yield distribution has dramatically changed uh, in all of this. So I just wanna explain as we go to the next slide, uh, what this all means for us. And, and uh, we often in yield distributions, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about uh, this distribution and what it means. And so if we think about the skewness of, of yields, when we've got a negative skewness is that we have a lot of data that are at the, the low side of the mean. Uh, and then we get a normal with no skewness. Uh, it's all normally distributed around that. Yield never data never behaves that way. Is if, if it's positively skewed, then we've got a lot of data points that are uh, above the mean and, and uh, median value of all of this. Uh, the kurtosis is basically the tightness around the mean distribution. Uh, if we've got a, uh, we can be normally distributed around there, but the, the larger the kurtosis, the tighter it is around the mean. It means that we have a uh, little skewness. Uh, the data are clumped very nicely around that mean. So the field's becoming more uniform. And so uh, the, the big advantage of Wayne's data is that uh, we have the capability of looking at this not only by the overall fields, but also the, the soils within that field. It's a really rich data set from that standpoint, not only because of the length of time, but the number of fields that we have uh, that we've been able to look at from this standpoint. So, you know, you, you look at these two parameters, they really become very interesting to us in terms of the dynamics. Uh, so if we can go on to the next one, uh, because what we found is that we shifted from positive to negative, or po negative to positive skewness. We increased the kurtosis, <clears throat> which means we tightened the distribution amount of mean. The more we shift to the right, the greater the income in the field because we have less low yielding areas of the field. Uh, so the greater portion of that field becomes a profit center. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of attention paid to, uh, you know, parts of the field that aren't making uh, producers money. Uh, you know, we, we look at that from, from uh, many different viewpoints, but in reality, uh, you know, as we begin to adopt uh, conservation tillage, we begin to adopt the cover crops, is that we're making more and more of that field a, a profit center because we're taking those low yielding parts out of the field. So let's go to the next one. <coughs> The other thing that we did uh, in uh, these slides, uh, we did some geospatial analysis. This is basically the relationship of one data point to another data point within that field. Uh, if you spend a lot of time looking at these, you see that the field average increased, but also that field became more uniform. The, the data points among each other were more tightly clustered uh, in all of this. Uh, we ran a number of these different analyses showing that uh, the relationship between one point to the next was, uh, was tighter all the time. And again, you see that with skewness and kurtosis as well, is that everything is becoming more tightly clumped ar around the mean. We saw that with the geospatial analysis as well. So let's go to the next one. Um, you know, and so what we've seen is that the fields have become uniform and the values of the yield monitor are more closely correlated across the field. There's been an increase in uniformity with time, uh, and only in extreme years, uh, the 2012, uh, you know, was there a lack of uniformity. Uh, you know, it's just, again, that uh, Franklin Silt Loam, uh, again, on, on, one, on particular fields, is that we saw a lot of yield distribution uh, that was quite large across that whole field. And again, that's what you expect in drought years. I mean, uh, we can improve it somewhat, but we, you know, we can't solve a problem if it doesn't rain. So let's just go to the next one. Um, so what we, I wanna spend just a little bit of time on the implications of this because we took the, the county level data 
uh, and looked at it and we found out that yield was ex negatively correlated with April and May rainfall at the county level. The more it rains in April and May, the lower the average yield. Uh, we've seen this in a number of different cases and primarily because we have these really wet spring conditions. Uh, on the average, we have a hard time getting that crop planted. It may be delayed. Uh, it may be too wet to really get good vigor in there. Uh, we have limited rooting depth uh, so that uh, that plant uh, has a limited rooting volume. And then when it turns off in July uh, with a normal rainfall, we end up with a limited uh, rooting volume of which the plant can extract water. If we also find that yields are positively correlated with July, September rainfall. So the more it rains in July and September, uh, the higher the average yield uh, in all of this. And, and what, so what we went back and looked at, and again, with the same fields that were around here is that in 2004, uh, there was about 3.9 bushels per inch of rainfall. And in 2018, that increased to, to 5.5, even though there was an increase in the annual rainfall or that seasonal rainfall over that time, there was an increase in how much production we were getting per inch of rainfall. You know, a 41% increase in, in water use efficiency uh, on, on one field, 49% on another, uh, you know, is a, is a very substantial increase. On soybeans, uh, we're about a 26% increase uh, in this. Uh, we also have looked at some data from, uh, from Ray, Gass, Ray and Chris Gasser uh, from southwestern Iowa on, this, on the same parameter. Uh, we found as they've adopted reduced tillage and cover crops is that their water use efficiency has increased about 40 to 50% as well. So this becomes a real dynamic that we need to look at and, and producers need to consider is that it's not only about reducing tillage and all the implications in here, but that plant is making more efficient use of the water. The other thing that has happened in this is that on the county average yields, uh, this negative correlation with April and May and the positive correlation with July, September is that when we look at Wayne's fields across that period of time, they are no longer showing those strong correlations to uh, excessive rainfall in the spring and the, and the low rainfall in the, in the summer, uh, because we're beginning to see that improving uh, the aggregate capacity of that, so we get more infiltration, better oxygen exchange, we have better water holding capacity and making use of uh, small rainfalls late in the summer. And the profitability of that field is going to increase because the fields have become more uniform. Uh, so we see all these different things that are occurring uh, in these dynamics. So let's go to the next one. So what we see in these changes in water use efficiency is that that soil is capable of storing more water. Uh, it's capable of storing more water because of the greater infiltration of, of rainfall events is that those aggregates near the surface are more stable so we can take advantage of this. That residue on the surface is making sure that we have reduced soil water evaporation and increasing transpiration. We're more resilient in years with uneven distribution of rainfall. We went back and looked at the years that had uh, problems with uh, rainfall and the weird rainfall patterns in July and August and things like this. And we found out that those yields weren't really reduced at all compared to the county average. Uh, we see that reduction in the correlations with the excessive spring and the, and the deficit summer rainfall. And so, and in a lot of cases, the reduced tillage and the increase in, increase of use of cover crops has basically weatherproof that system, uh, which we've uh, always talked about but uh, this is now the data begin to show that. So we have an increased ability to convert soil water into grain. Uh, that's the bottom line of, of all of this when we begin to think about these dynamics uh, that are going on in the field. Let's go to the next one. So the lessons along the journey uh, in this, and, and it really is a journey that, that Wayne and I have been talking about, and it's, it's really this partnership between 
producers and, and us in research that really needs to be understood and how we capitalize on that to, to help build farming practices for the future. And so we see that this change in uniformity of the field with this combination of reduced tillage and cover crops, uh, we have shown over time uh, in, on uh, other data, not uh, Wayne's data, but where we've had conventional tillage with uh, corn and soybean rotation is that that conventional tillage system is losing about a thousand pounds of carbon per acre per year. Uh, but if we take and, and just reduce the tillage in there, we can take that carbon balance to a positive within a two year period, uh, you know, which is very dramatic uh, in all of this. And, and even adding cover crops even adds more carbon. You see that as evidence in, in Wayne's uh, soil organic matter contents over time. We see a shift in the distribution of yields around the mean. So we have fewer lower yields and, and a tighter distribution around that mean that the field's more uniform. Uh, those changes in organic matter are coupled, related, are coupled with water infiltration and availability. We get more water into that soil and we make it available for that crop. Cultural operations are more timely because of improved soil conditions. So you look at springs like uh, 2013, 2018, 2017, uh, 2019, and potentially 2020, uh, is that you know we have these wet soil conditions because we're changing our rainfall pattern to more spring rainfall. Cover crops and then reduced tillage allow those producers to get in earlier uh, to be able to, to traffic across that field. Uh, fields become more resource use efficient. Uh, they're more efficient in using light, uh, capturing light because that plant isn't water stressed uh, as well. They're more efficient use of water. They're more efficient use of nutrients and all of this. And there's the other piece of this that if you look across this time, as we've kind of pointed out, is that management is dynamic. Uh, there's a constant adaptation and tweaks that that producers are doing. And, and Wayne pointed this out is you go to uh, strip tillage, you go to uh, side dress applications, you go to cultivar selection, you go to all these different dynamics is that we have to realize that management becomes a dynamic in this system that, uh, and we, we expect that to occur. Uh, producers are gonna learn from adaptation. Uh, let's go to the next one. Just to give you an example, this is not Wayne's data, this is some of our own data, uh, where we've, uh, each one of those uh, data points that we've sampled at uh, 50 meter by 50 meter grids, roughly 150 by 150 feet, we've sampled them down to uh, uh, 1.2 meters. This is the dry aggregate uh, distribution. This is a conversion of, from a conventional to a no-till with a cover crop. We've doubled that microbial biomass in two years after the conversion. Uh, you know, and, and so one of the things we have to realize that we changed a positive to a, a negative to a positive carbon balance in that two year period, the aggregate distribution began to change, the microbial biomass began to change. These are phenomenal rates of change uh, in soils. And so, and, I think we need to get past this myth that the soil is slow to respond. It's very quick to respond to the types of management, positive management changes that we can do in this. Let's go to the next one. So when we talk about the system uh, and all of this, uh, I've spent a lot of time on this genetics by environment, by management interaction. Uh, think about it this way. Uh, producers, uh, management is what they oversee because environment's what they're trying to overcome, because genetics is what they're trying to optimize. Um, and you look across this sometimes in the, the yield history is that genetics don't always respond to the way we select or the way we expect. Uh, there also needs to be a constant attention to nutrient management. You, you see this in Wayne's data when going to side dress applications or if you're changing tillage practices, you need to think about nutrient management and that that management has to evolve to take advantage of the changing soil conditions. As we think about improving that infiltration rate, what management has to happen in terms of nutrients, uh, planting uh, conditions, all these different things that are going on. So it's a systems approach that we need to be looking at, uh, that we just can't say, well, 
let's change cover crops and expect it to work this way. Uh, you know, let's look at nutrients. Let's look at how water's being infiltrated. Let's look at the hybrid and cultivar selection. Let's look at all these things as a puzzle out there as part of the overall system. So let's go to the next one. So let, we're going to spend just a little bit of time on the implications. This is a little bit of uh, tag team between Wayne and I, uh, and this draw down through that. So you look at this as how does this reduce the risk and increase management options uh, along the way? Uh, if you look at these different dynamics that's going on, I think you begin to see that uh, is the Wayne system has become uh, less risky. Uh, and has improved and increased some of the management options is going on. So Wayne, I'll let you comment along with that as well. Well, I think, you know, in addition to that, there's uh, a lot of things happening out there. You, you've got a lot more options when, when, when soil gives it to you. And I think that's when we talk about the increase in management options. Soil structure is a tremendous tool. Uh, when you have it, you can do a lot of things you can't do uh, when you don't have it. Can this affect land values? You know, as I alluded to earlier in there about the dis discussion on organic matter, until farmers really ask that question, you know, what, what the organic matter is or what the value of organic matter is, or if landlords or, or people selling or marketing land ask that question, it's probably not going to have an effect on land values. But I tell you, uh, it should. Uh, because definitely there's some pr productivity advantages. There's much lower risk and so forth to a, uh, uh, a regenerative, uh, resilient farm versus one that isn't. And so that conversation has to be driven by those of us of concern, especially that would be the farmers. What might this do to rental agreements? You know, I don't have a son that's going to take over my operation, but we've got you know, land that has seen, you know, many, many years of regenerative uh, actions on, and it will definitely make a difference in the type of a land lease that I, that I have with the next person farming that. Uh, you know, we're not going to let somebody come in with a deep ripper and destroy that soil structure. We're going to make sure that there's a continuation of soil healthy practices on that farm operation. That's, that's going to be a part of the lease. And, and I'm fortunate we're in an area where a, a lot of young farmers are already adopting, you know, uh, positive soil health practices. So it's not going to be difficult to find a young farmer out there that is going to be able to take it over and do what I would like to see done. Could this broaden the offering of crop insurance discounts? If you remember the, the bell-shaped curve on those yields, uh, I've seen this discussion. Ryan Stockwell from National Wildlife Federation gave a presentation at National No-Till Conference about three or four years ago that I thought was really indicative of what's happened. And if I get in a discussion with crop insurance agents, they always say, well, APH, that, that's what determines what it should be. If you got a high APH, you know, you should get a, a better rate on your crop insurance. Well, let's say we got two farms with a 200 bushel APH, and one of them has an extremely wide bell curve. And then you have a farm with high soil health with a 200 APH, and that bell curve is much narrower. Where is the crop insurance industry's risk? It's on that wide bell curve, especially on the bottom side of it. So that's why there's interest in crop insurance discounts uh, for uh, soil health practices. That's why we're seeing NGOs, you know, on both a national basis and state basis. That's some of the reasoning behind the $5 crop insurance discount in Iowa is to gather data to help support that concept. And, and so, yeah, there's really, uh, some implications there that are important. How does this change the discussion of carbon sequestration? Yeah, I got two and a half percent more organic matter than I used to have. If this really becomes a market out there, I would think that farms in, in my position would have something that would be able to participate in that conversation uh, and, and get paid for. 
And so I think that's, you know, it, it also drives a reasoning why we should be trying to do practices that uh, sequester carbon, because you can do that and still have it a profitable farm operation. Can this create more engagement from the food industry? It already has, you know, I, I came down Knoxville and spoke to a group, Sarah asked me to speak to cover crop group. Pepsi, I think down there is uh, putting money out for farmers to help uh, support cover crop work. So these, these organizations are looking for, for ways to support uh, better soil health, better practices on the farm. It just makes, makes more sense for them to be engaged. And, and we're, we're seeing a lot of things on a national basis and that discussion continues to get more involved. How does this affect federal and state farm policy? This one's been interesting because I sit on the American Soybean Board yet, and uh, I'm a real. F Might move your phone away, Jerry, if you did. I don't. We're getting some feedback. Anyway, maybe it's better here. Okay. But it's interesting, I sit on the Soybean Association Board. I, I, I lead the other conservation policy directives. And uh, I like to write farm policy. But boy, do I, do I get into this uh, discussion with my friends to the north. My folks from Minnesota and North Dakota, uh, they're, they're definitely, uh, uh, they feel they need to be black. They feel cover crops don't work up there. and. Uh, no-till doesn't work up there and they're very reluctant to want to uh, support federal farm policy that gives any advantages um, to farmers that are and so I gotta go down through here again uh, there we go Can this lift the burden of water quality and quantity? Boy, I think that's simple. If you got healthy soil, you're going to have clean water. You can't have, they don't separate itself. Because to get to healthy soil, we're going to do a lot of practices that are going to reduce nitrate and phosphate loss to the rivers. And, and uh, it's just a given. So the one and two, those practices just work so well hand in hand together. And can these farm practices make farming more profitable? Well, I think the resilience you've built into the operation is, is something that's important. I mean, I'm to the point of, do I even need to take crop insurance anymore? Because as you built resilience into the system, I guess my only risk is price as much as it is, is, is production yield anymore. And so there's a lot of ways to, to, to you know, take the practices and, and, and make them profitable on your farm operation. And, and we'll cover that more tomorrow in another presentation that I'm giving, you know, more specifically on cover crops. So finally, we get back to that journey where we, we all started out together on and uh, you know, after, you know, 40 some years of farming, you know, I, I have seen cleaner water in our operation. We monitor tile water and so forth, and we know that it is cleaner than it used to be, especially under cover crops. Our farms are profitable. We built resilience into them, and, and uh, you know, we do quite well farming up there. We're a low cost operation and still maintain, you know, at or above county yields. We've seen less variability. That was the basis of a lot of this presentation. And uh, yeah, that, you know, that's obvious as it reduces our risk in the farm operation. We got a positive carbon message. Man, you don't build two and a half percent organic matter without, uh, you know, seeing that, that improvement in carbon. But I think mostly, you know, we got healthy, resilient soils. And, you know, that's, that's what this conference is about, is reclaiming resilience. And, uh, you know, we're happy to say we've done it on our farms. It's been fun to do. It's made farming enjoyable and, and something I, you know, still look forward to at my age every year, you know, putting in another crop and seeing what we can do better the coming year. My question for you is, where are you in your journey? Hopefully you've... you've you found some tidbits here to be a benefit to you. Hopefully you're on a journey. Hopefully you're on a journey that's going to be as fun as mine has been and, and, uh, and that you can find the, you know, the benefits and the joy of farming in a way that's really beneficial for, 
for our society today. So I'm going to turn it over now to questions. Did we lose Jerry? Okay. Yes. Good question. And uh, that's something I, you know, I just personally sat down and put it on a long spreadsheet just to track what, what fertilizer input dollars have been. Of course, they change with, with price, but we've been pretty stable on input, stable to down, if anything. And it was just uh, yesterday I seen on uh, Facebook or Twitter, uh, uh, FarmDoc just come out with their, their budgets for 2020 for Illinois. And I noticed I'm running about $30 an acre on fertilizer costs less than what they what they are planning on uh, budgeting, you know, for Illinois yields at the same level of yields that we are at. So yes, I, I think it does. It has made a difference in our in our fertilizer budget. Right. Yeah, we stay at MRTN or just just above, you know, 150 pounds is our nitrogen budget. And I know a lot of farmers on a corn bean rotation that are going to run 200 or plus, uh, might maybe get a little bit more yield. Uh, I've seen articles that talk about, well, they can build a better crop insurance base, raise their APH, and yeah, is it is it the right thing to do? I you know I don't know. I try to, I I try to look see how much I can maximize the amount of y you know yield I can get out of the uh, dollar input and and try to be cognizant of what it's doing in the environment. You know. Yes, John. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to try to put that in. Yeah, the question is, you know, Jerry, long term is, is tracking, uh, you know, profitability and production yield, you know, over a period of time. I put a spreadsheet together here this winter, you know, just to do that, you know. You know, the one thing well fights land rental cost, you know, and that, that's, bit, that's been one that hasn't come down too much. And, and we've noticed incomes that have gone way up and now they've came way down. And we've noticed seed costs that have stayed rather level. And in that whole time frame, your profitability keeps getting narrowed up and up and, and our profitability is a lot narrower than it used to be but we're still we're still making some money we're not yeah well i can't give you a conventional answer anymore because i don't have any but uh Come listen tomorrow. We'll we'll cover that a little bit more in that presentation. Advantages of cover crops, yes. Our cereal rye, uh, we fly. Jerry, question was how we put putting our rye on. Um, we fly our cereal rye on airily into standing corn, which would be ahead of soybeans, and we have been all over on rates. We've been from the 70 pounds down to the. 45 pounds, we're at 55 is where we're running it right now. We're experimenting um, on one farm where we've got, put a third third oats in, took it one third rye out. So we got an oats rye combination. I think we're gonna see if we can bump up the mycorrhizal fungi benefits from that. And uh, otherwise, uh, behind the soybeans harvest, uh, we're drilling 55 pounds right as soon as we can get the drills in there and as far north as we are that's you know we've had real nice rye in the spring and we've had poultry rye in the spring you know probably in the drills but uh, it did come up this fall anyway and that's more than i could say than a year ago 
Yes. Did you hear that, Derek, Jerry? Yeah. Sir, am I on now? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah, if we, if we start thinking about implications of this uh, widespread, you know, I think that one of the things that we've seen in these data, and not only in uh, Wayne's data, but other data across the state, is that uh, we would increase the resilience. Uh, we would come closer to our uh, attainable yields in there. And, and we could begin to think about uh, the diversity, again, going back to the slide that's on there with profitable farms and healthy, resilient soils. <laughs> if you think about this positive carbon message, uh, getting more carbon into the soil so we get greater infiltration, we're making a more resilient, so we're weatherproofing our systems, is that we'd have a lot less variability among the years. Not only would it change uh, the economics of, that, of, of production because we would become more efficient in terms of utilization of nutrients. Uh, just let me explain that for a second as we've seen as we've improved the, the carbon and the uh, dynamics of soil and the microbial activity within the soil is that those systems, uh, microbial systems are constantly cycling nutrients during the year. And so we get a lot of nutrients that are available late in the growing season that uh, contributes to that uh, nutrient availability during the grain filling period. So that's why we can have less nutrients applied and an increase in yield along the way because the microbes are doing everything for us. You know, same thing in terms of those water dynamics. Uh, you know, we're, we're taking the flashiness out of the system uh, because those soils, uh, they, they absorb water, they hold water, uh, you know, the, the, we don't have the runoff coming off, uh, all these different things because not only are we changing the uh, the seasonal dynamics of this, but we're changing the intensity of our storm. So our farming systems have to be capable of handling more and more intense rainfall events. And so when you have the cover, uh, you have the, the capacity of infiltrating water into that is that you have less runoff and you have less flashiness in streams. So, you know, we're going to see that dynamic as well. So I think one of the big impacts that we would see if we adopted this is that uh, we could uh, take care of a lot of our nutrient uh, movement, both nitrogen and phosphorus in the streams, but we would take care of the flashiness of those streams to, to start with. Yes. I have another question for Gary. How many gallons per acre was 1% of organic material benefit us? Did you hear that, Jerry? How many gallons per acre does 1% organic matter benefit us? What are that? I've heard one. I didn't one quite inch. hear all that, Wayne. Is that uh, how, how many what's gallons? the benefits of one percent organic matter increase? Yes. Okay. So you think about this in terms of one percent organic matter increase. Uh, it's roughly about twenty-five thousand gallons of water <laughs> into that. Uh, you you can think about that from uh, the nutrient availability side, but the the water tends to be our most limiting factor. And so you think about adding that additional amount of water. And I'll go back to a comment that Wayne made on the 2080 rule. We found that 20% that of our yield loss was occurring 80% of the time because of short-term water stresses. Uh, primarily during that July, August rainfall or July, August growing period. You know, and, and you know, basically it says, you know, we end up with uh, parts of that field that have low organic matter. Uh, you look at those low water, old, cold, holding soils and everything is that 
fields are very uniform at the time we get to tasseling and then all the variability begins to increase after tasseling and it's due to soil water dynamics. And so as we increase the, the, the uniformity of that field is that we've done that because we have more water available to that. That 20% uh, yield loss we begin to nibble away at. You know, I, I can't prevent a drought, uh, but I can make use of small rainfall events one of the positive things of having that residue out there on that soil surface is that we end up making very good use of small rainfalls, those half inch, three quarter inch rainfalls that uh, wet that soil surface, maybe only down to uh, two or three inches, but under a, the cover crop system, we see roots right near that surface that can take that water up and take that nutrient up. So that's where we get some of that efficiency as well. So I think we need to understand that when we begin to change tillage and we begin to add cover crops, everything changes within that soil. That 1% organic matter over time uh, has a lot of implications for water, has a lot of implications for nutrients, has a lot of implications for early season vigor in terms of growth because that plant isn't stressed uh, because of the saturated soil conditions, there's plenty of oxygen get back and forth within that soil profile. Okay, we've got room for one more. Yes. As much as I can get. We, could, could be, I think that buries in, you know, in, in where you are in, 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 in different soils. The only guide I had was by pulling fence row samples, and in our part of the area, the fences were established in the 1800s when the land was bought from the government, and we haven't seen tillage in them, so uh, it's as close as I can get what my potential is. I have noticed things if, you know, tapered off. You know, we don't want peat because we know peat's not real productive, so there is a, you know, a limit of what, what's value there, but, you know, as long as we continue to, you know, utilize, you know, cover crops in our system, and, and take advantage of the nutrient building and so forth that they can do and, and the soil structure and so forth, uh, we'll be happy with where the organic matter goes. I, I expect it to flatten off. You know, I, it's not gonna be on that you know, upward curve like it has been, but I think it'll still continue to grow.